fun, but <coughs> it was like over. The harvest season was pretty much over, except for mushrooms. So I, at the time, I thought, oh, I should do it again in the spring. And now here we are, very beginning of spring. You have the whole thing laid out ahead of you. You can really have it all in your mind what you're going to want to look for this year. So. So amazingly, even though I love picking all the wild plants and seeing them, I don't apparently take pictures because when I went through my pictures, I didn't have like any photographs of wild plants or anything really. So I used uh, pictures from all these folks, Milo Burcham, Matt Groff, who's a guy in Sitka, naturalist in Sitka, Brett Cole, Aaron and Haig of Ground Truth Trekking, and also lots of random things I found on the internet. The internet, very useful. So late winter, this is where we are at right now. And this is just a beautiful blueberry bush with the buds swelling. Um, the buds on the bushes is a real interesting thing to me because it's taken me, it took me until I was at least 28. And don't feel bad if you haven't figured this out yet, but the buds form in the fall. And they're slowly swelling all winter. And so I always thought the buds grow in the spring, and because that's when you notice them, when they look like this. But <coughs> um, pay attention this year, and you'll notice that the buds actually form in the fall, and you can see them, they're tiny, and then they grow throughout the winter whenever there's a warm spell. So you'll just see them getting bigger and bigger, and you can think, ooh, spring's coming. But when they're at this stage, I actually like to eat them, and I recommend if you especially are getting late winter fever where you're really wanting it to be spring and it's really just not, and there's a lot of fall springs like we've had this year, um, the buds just have a really like zingy, fresh flavor, and especially fun if, now, once you get comfortable with IDing plants, if you have kids, I, I personally think it's really fun to have like your kids start to learn the plants and then they like my son loves eating them even though they're so strong and I think I mean you're not going to make a dinner out of buds obviously but I think there's probably a lot of vitamins in those tiny little buds so every time he eats one of them yes. <laughs> went down the hatch and um, I mean my kids obviously I, I know a lot about plants so I've been teaching them about plants since they were babies, but they can really, you can tell the difference between a blueberry bush and a fall season bush, kind of bush, so it's pretty fun. Um, so next. I kind of think of late winter as the, the time to harvest from the sea. It seems like the sea wakes up a little earlier than it does <coughs> in the land. And so we've got, you know, the, the hooligan wren, which is mysterious. There's a winter, late winter hooligan run, and then a spring hooligan run. Sometimes they seem to melt into one. I'm never really sure. But if, if you're interested in catching hooligan, has anyone here done that? It's so fun if you have a hooligan net and if they're running. Sometimes if they're running in a clear street, you can see them, I promise. But um, if they're running, they're so easy to catch. You can quickly catch more hooligan than you want to eat. Um, and some people don't like the mushy texture of hooligan if you cook them fresh, but if you smoke them like into um, like almost dry, like a jerky type of um, mostly dry, then they're they get a nice chewy texture and they're really good. So if by chance you see some hooligan nets in town, you'll see them sticking out of the backs of trucks sometimes. Then if you see one, you know it's either they're here or they're about to be here and someone's waiting. <laughs> so then you can start looking out for them. And um, the smelter here right now. Ooh. Yeah, I'll, I'll get it. I've never I've eaten this before. before. Oh, how far? <coughs> um, we were seeing schools in the kayaking yesterday. Mm. Um, yeah. From the road down to the road. I will stop. And they're in the harbor so a lot too. Yeah,
if that's true, but it's maybe possible. Um, and then, of course, halibut, everyone's familiar with that, and winter kings, razor clams. If you get a chance to go out to a razor clam beach, of course, that's always really cool. We do have little mud clams around here, and they're pretty decent. I've eaten them every day, there's some mud clams. My favorite kind of seaweed for eating, uh, dulse, and it's really hard to see with the light the way it is, but so imagine this is the shape of each frond, but they're a, a dark reddish brown color. And they only grow at the lowest, they'll only be exposed at the lowest tide. So if you look through the tide book for um, low tides in late winter to early spring, you don't want to wait too far into the summer, they'll start to get leached out. So you want to go, just like a plant, they grow their new frond, and then it starts to deteriorate. So you want to get it when it's kind of new and crisp. Um, and I do think that, the, like I said, I feel like the ocean kind of wakes up a little sooner than the land. So May is a good time to look for adults. We have, I've looked for them out at, um, I found them out past Orca Cannery. But I like to go pretty far out there because I feel like those creosote pylons might put some nasty in the water. Nano, is dulse the kind of um, seaweed that uh, the Yakutat folks bring up every year? So variety, it's, it's a reddish brown also, but probably I don't know what kind. I don't know it's really good what kind, what they kind bring. that they use, but I know that people in Haines really. I used to live in Haines before here, and they definitely harvested the clinkets there. Harvested a lot of seaweed, and they would dry it on. Um, they would like lay out a bed sheet on the grass and just pile, not pile, but lay out in a single layer all their adults to dry in the sun. Mm -hmm. They went for a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And um, you really can't see it at all, but a nice thing to do with adults if you get some, um, you can cut it up and put it in soup, anything that, in, it's a little leathery, so you, you either want to cook it, like boil it, or in this case, you dry toast it in a cast iron skillet, and it, um, becomes crispy, very crispy. It's really nice. And you can add just a little bit of oil just to make the sesame seeds stick. And if you want, you could add a little extra salt. The people in Haines added sugar to their seaweed as well. Then we have spring. Everybody knows what these are. Does anybody not know what these are? Fiddleheads. Okay, so these. When did you get to town? A couple months ago. So you haven't seen any green stuff here. Where did you come from? California. There's ferns in California, right? Mm -hmm. Do you know what ferns look like? Yeah. yeah. So fiddleheads are the baby fern. Here's the stem. And there's like a little fiddlehead, like the little curled top of fiddle. And that's where the fern is. It's all curled up. And so what happens in the spring is it busts out through the ground and then eventually unfurls into a fern. If you get it at this stage, it's good to eat. Um, if you wait until the leaves start to unfurl, then it has a toxin in it that I think it inhibits your absorption of B vitamins, so it's not like it's going to kill you, but you're not supposed to eat it after the leaves start to unfurl. After the leaves, not like this, this is good, but when they actually start to come out from the stem. Um, that's actually a perfect little head right there. But you'll notice all this flaky brown stuff is like papery and it's not, it doesn't hurt you, but it's really annoying. And so it's easy to pick. We have so many ferns here and it's a really fun thing to go out and pick. But then you have to get all those flakes off. And no, I do not have tricks. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, um, my best thing is, yeah? I was just on the, a trick? On the brown. Back in Maine, the climate was a little drier, but uh, almost everybody would have uh, a screen thing mm -hmm. made out of a quarter inch screen that they put their fiddleheads in and just shake it, and it would just get the knock the paper off of them, mm -hmm. and it would sift out, and then you just have nice clean fiddleheads after you were done. You have ostrich ferns there, though, right? Aren't they like not very scaly? No, they're they they have the same amount of skin as they do here. Maybe I've only seen pictures of them after they were already painted. That could be. 
because I, I remember seeing pictures. Of it. I think there are ostrich groups from the East Coast and being like, "What? There's no scales." Yeah. I just, I would just fry in butter or put the scales on scales. Yeah, some people don't mind scales. Meadow, are, is that, are all ferns going to do that, or are fiddle yes. a certain type of fern? All ferns do that. And they're all, are but, all of our um, ferns edible at that stage? All of our ferns are edible. The Really, it's just the shield fern and lady fern that have big enough uh, fiddleheads to harvest. But yeah, you, you can pick any. There is a bracken fern, which I think grows in southeast, that's considered too toxic to eat, but I don't believe it grows around here. So, um, what I do personally to get the brown stuff off is I just, under running water, I just rub it. And then I just, it's annoying and I go through every one. I've tried shaking them and I haven't found it really comes off. Well, I think it's because it's so much damper here than yeah, like maybe. back there. But maybe maybe dry them a little and then shake. Because that's yeah. how we do it instead of you just under running water. After we shake them. After you shake them, right? So yeah, if you're going out fiddlehead picking, and especially if you're young, you don't have kids, and you have like all day, and you have a giant bag, and you're really picking a lot of fiddleheads, not that I speak from experience, just remember you're going to have to either like the scales and eat them and not have a problem with it or get the scales off. And um, in case anyone is interested, I they do not freeze well in my opinion. I froze blanched and froze like five gallons of them when I first moved to town and they were not good. They got like stringy and limp at the same time. If you saute them in butter first, then they freeze well. Oh really? They can. Yeah. They were, oh, can? Mm -hmm. Have you frozen them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. So can you explain again just at what point mm -hmm. it's not good to pick them? Yeah. So see how those little leaflets are kind of poised and ready to spring forth into the world. As soon as they spring forth, you don't, you don't want to eat it anymore. It's like not so clear cut like that. It's not like you're going to get sick. If, but as just a general rule, um, I've seen some books say under six inches, over six inches. But in my experience, depending on the ground cover, they can be really tall before they start greening up and unfolding those leaves. And you don't want to pass those guys up because they have a long succulent stem. So um, I just go by the leaves. So if they're still folded in, it's good. Once they start to fold out, then it's not. Dandelion. Our dandelion does not taste like the dandelion that you may have bought at a farmer's market, but if you get them small enough, um, they can be perfectly fine added into a salad with other stuff. They're pretty bitter, but um, if you cook them, like at least half of the bitterness just goes down. So I recommend cooking them or adding small leaves into salads. Uh, so there's some cleaned, not, well, maybe not cleaned, they look wet, fiddle heads and fireweed shoots. So these are, again, fireweed shoots. Um, and of course, we have fireweed everywhere around here. And when the shoots come up like that in the spring, you can eat the whole thing. Uh, it's nice. It's got like a juicy, succulent stem. And then, but it does have a pretty astringent taste. So again, I prefer it cooked myself. And I don't necessarily sit down to like a whole plate full of um, Choose, but it's great added into stuff. And I just wanted to mention at this point that um, a lot of, well, when you're learning how to forage for wild plants and you have your, your field guide, they almost always show the plant in its flowering or at the very least mature stage because that's the point at which you can botanically identify a species is when it's flowering because a lot of um, ID comes from the flower. So that's generally what they show in field guides. But when you want to eat a plant, you don't generally want to wait for it to flower. You want to eat it right here. You want to eat it when it's young and small and has just come out of from under the snow and it's juicy and tender and not overly bitter. So that's like something that it's 
I mean, I, I don't really have a good, there's no guidebook as far as I know that shows you what the plants look like when they come out. You just kind of have to learn that from other people. Um, yeah. But I'm going to show you most of our best, um, our best few plants for getting at this stage. So, and you'll notice those are red. Can you see the reddish orange <coughs> in that fireweed shoots there? Oh, that's real common for fireweed and a lot of other plants when they come up in the spring. Does anybody know why that happens? No? I don't know why it happens. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes they're all green, sometimes they're like all red, but mostly they're green and red like that. And I don't know why, but it's um, totally fine. <laughs> it doesn't mean the plant is poisonous or anything like that. So, my favorite thing to do with all those greens in the last picture, um, spring is such a busy time of year, and it would be nice if we had time to make a lot of fancy things out of all those beautiful leaves and shoots, but a lot of times we're too busy, so my favorite thing is just ramen, <laughs> so trashy, throw some greens in there, and it's just, it's definitely more nutritious and delicious, so. I have to make a comment about Kanisha even made, um, she pickled fiery shoots mm -hmm. and it was so beautiful. It, she did it pretty much just like you're pickling fish. So she had garlic and onion and, you know, pickling spices and it was kind of a pinkish purple and it tasted really good. And every year I've said I was going to do that. But she just experimented, you know, she just checked, tried it. And I think it would be a really great addition to pickling fish. Just put this kind of the color. So. Yeah, pickles are great. But this plant is my favorite wild shoot to eat, and um, I really regret that you can't see that picture over there. Um, this is called twisted stock or wild cucumber or watermelon berry, just to be confusing. Uh, Streptococcus simplexifolius is the botanical name. This is a classic one, and I'm going to show you a picture of the way it looks in a field guide next. If I had to search the internet, because I don't have my own pictures, I had to search the internet to find a picture of it at the harvest stage. Mm -hmm. It was hard. <laughs> so this is what it looks like when you want to harvest it, and it has this long, succulent, crispy stem that is really wonderful. And our twisted stock grows like crazy here, and we get fat. Fat stalks. Sometimes I'll find stalks that are like fat, fat. easily as fat as asparagus or fatter. Um, and I like to use it a lot like asparagus. Pickle. It is fantastic pickle because it does have a kind of a cucumbery flavor. So when you pickle it, you have that sort of you know, crispy stuff in the stalk and a little bit of cucumber flavor. Um, but it also has these nice things on it too. So it's a little different. And again, there is red, uh, not just red and pink, but red speckles, right? Oftentimes, especially these shielding leaves at the bottom will have red speckles around them, making it look incredibly poisonous to me. It just looks like you don't eat plants with red speckles on them, <laughs> but um, it is not poisonous. Here it's growing next to, you see that at all? Yeah. Um, an actually poisonous plant. So that's false hellebore on the right. Yeah, you really can't see it at all. Uh, look up, if you're going to go harvest twisted stock, look up false hellebore and see if you can, or in Jan Schofield's book, she has a picture of false hellebore. And in the picture that she has in her book, they really don't look very similar, and you think, oh, I'm not going to confuse those two, but I have seen them occasionally when they're growing together look similar enough that if you weren't paying attention or if you were picking with children, they maybe would snap off the false hellebore. So here's the way you know. Um, the twisted stalk has a stem, an obvious stem, with leaves coming off, and you can see how the leaf is wrapped around there. And then there's a section of stem, and then there's another leaf up here, and so on. False hellebore, oops. False hellebore is, um, it's, uh, got 
layers of leaves. So when it's in that shoot stage, it has all of the layers coming up. And if you were to peel it apart, you'd actually see like a leaf almost. Although, in fact, it's in the lily family. It also has the leaves are pleated, very um, obviously pleated like an accordion. So you can kind of see that in the picture. I can pass this around to somebody. Oh, do you have a picture of it? Just a okay. little yeah. pocketbook. Yes, please do. Maybe one see that. Feel free to pop on that. Yeah, because in my opinion, they don't look anything alike, and it is completely obvious that they're not the same plant. However, like I said, if you're new to plants, or if you're with kids, or you're just picking plants and not paying attention. So it is really important just to be aware. This is the mature uh, twisted stalk. This is the stage at which people call it watermelon berry. Yep, see the, the eyes suddenly seeing recognition. Yeah, and we have it all over, right? There's lots of this stuff around. Um, and the berries do taste a little watermelony and have some big seeds in them. There's supposedly, if you eat too many of the berries, you have to scoot to the bathroom. Um, I've never eaten that many of them, so I don't. So yeah, here's what you will see in a guidebook, and this is why I wanted to make that point. If you go looking for this plant, it's going to be stringy, it's not going to taste very good. You don't want to eat it there. You just want to eat the berries. At this point, the good part of that plant is the berries. So I eat the leaves at this stage. After it's even got berries on it? They're really sweet. All the way down to the stalk. I think they're super sweet. I know it's not that. a bitter plant. It has an interesting flavor that I'm not sure I would like in maturity, but it's not um, bitter. I don't do the stock. The, the, the leaves. The leaves. They're really thin, you know, so uh -huh. they're not chewy. They are. This looks a little kind of yeah, sweet. Yeah, they're thin and brittle. They're not. Now, um, one of our animals. Black bear, I feel like, is um, a vastly underutilized resource in Cordova. Although, Charlotte, maybe. <laughs> I mean, I feel like we have lots of black bear around. Is that true? Does the harvest still on the Carver River Delta? I can tell you. I can make it to the There's third bear from Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I just don't. <laughs> so, I actually have some connections with big game guides, and they get people from down south who are coming up who want to get their trophy bear. And when they get a black bear, they're actually required, legally required to salvage the meat and give it to somebody who cares enough to eat it. So I am the person who cares enough, and I just, um, I have my couple of contacts, and they call me when they're flying into town. Sometimes they'll bring me like six frozen bear in quarters. And so if anyone is interested in getting on my little list, when those bear come in, there's not usually very much warning, and I need to find homes for all of them. I can really only use two. So, if anyone wants to get on my black bear list, leave bear. All right, talk to me afterwards. Um, the thing with bear is, has anyone ever had bear besides Chris? Oh, lots of people have had bear. Did you Hi. like it? Mm -hmm. Stews. Longer hug, not so, so much. Not so much. Did you prepare it? I yeah. had you dressed the animal? No. no. Um, with our deer and moose, at least on the coast, people generally like to hang their meat and let it age because it gets tender and it gets more flavorful and definitely, in my opinion, more luscious. <coughs> Bear, you don't want to age it at all. You want to get it as soon as it's been killed, the fast like a fish. The faster you get it into the freezer, the better. So um, I feel personally that people who've had bad bear experiences, <coughs> it well might be because uh, it was just yep. okay. improperly handled. <coughs> I feel like it has a very clean flavor, almost less game flavor than moose and deer. It is, however, extremely lean. <coughs> When they're good to eat is in the spring, and they've just come out of hibernation, and they're growing <coughs> some plants, but they're seriously lean. So we're talking lean, lean meat, and I do like to mix it up into sausage. I, I mostly make burger and sausage out of my black bear. You can do roast as well. It doesn't make good steaks, in my opinion, because you can't age it, and I, I kind of think the steak needs to be aged to make it tender. But um, so I just take it to the butcher, and he grinds it up for me at the end of his day. 
takes him like five minutes, and I come home with like a five <coughs> bear burger, and make a bunch of the sausage, which is not really sausage because it's not very fatty, but it tastes good. <coughs> really so, I recommend if you have a chance, uh, try bear. So now moving on to early summer, we have, of course, our fish, greens and flowers. <coughs> I wanted to talk a little bit about salmon. I feel like we all know pretty much how I cook salmon, but maybe you haven't done one of these things, and if you haven't, these are some of my favorite ways to use um, all the fish or to use fish. So the fresh salmon cakes up there in the corner, um, Kate Alexander, then Kate Alexander introduced me to these where she would take, after she has filleted her salmon, she takes a spoon and she scrapes all the meat that's left on the carcass, and so it's clean to me. And then she chops it up, she saw a recipe for this in Cook's Illustrated, um, to make fresh salmon cakes. So I don't know if you guys have ever made salmon cakes with cooked salmon, or the recipe originally called for you take a salmon fillet, and you chop it into lots of little pieces, but you don't want to grind it too much. So really that stuff that you get off after you've filleted the salmon with a spoon is like primo and perfect for making these fresh salmon cakes. And I, when I do my big haul or my big processing in June or July, um, I end up with, I mean, I, I'm a decent filleter, but I still end up with a pretty big mound of scrap after I clean all those carcasses with a spoon, and it's all just so gratifying to me to turn it into something that's really extra delicious. And the kids, if they did it in barbecue sauce, it's like chicken nuggets for them, their version. Um, and then Gravlox, if, has anyone done Gravlox? Mm -hmm. That was kind of a revelation to me for some reason when I first had it. It's um, cured with salt and sugar, sometimes vodka is added. Um, and dill, right, as the flavoring, and that's a Norwegian thing. Okay. And then you slice it really thinly and eat it with crackers, cream cheese, onions, lemon, whatever you want to add. But um, <coughs> definitely really delicious, and it's more or less just raw salmon. Is that the I mean, filet? It's sure, that but, way? but the filet? Yeah, that you eat the whole one. But I have a question. How, how do you take the parasites in the salmon? If you so I them? only use salmon that's been frozen. Okay, yeah, this is the box. thing. I, I mean, don't use the fresh salmon. Everyone has a different opinion, but I've seen a lot of worms in salmon. As, I as just so it's really just don't like want to eat them. <laughs> I mean, maybe they'd be killed by the salt and it would be fine. But anyway, I only use frozen salmon when I'm doing grab locks or when I'm doing sushi. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure what is, you're supposed to freeze it for maybe 48 hours or something, but I just make it from frozen meat. You know, I, so I just made poke a few nights ago. It was like this kind of, I looked up a recipe and they were saying, oh, you know, use sushi salmon. Which the definition being that they use a flash and throw it, you know, freezing. So apparently it, those parasites better. So like if you do it at Copper River, for instance, they do a flash freeze. So the type of freezing might be important. I think it might be. It might be ideal if you can. It'd be ideal to have a flash freeze instead of just in your freezer when you put a whole bunch of salmon in it right at a time. For sure. If you're gonna be serving it raw, I think yeah. it might not be a bad idea. Do you feel like maybe it doesn't even kill them at all in a chest freezer? You know, I just I've heard there is a distinction, and I don't know any more than that. I'm thinking that it's just a that it's a difference in how long it takes to freeze. That maybe they're because I think so <coughs> great it has to be frozen for 48 hours. But yeah, they're freezing it fast, and they're freezing it colder than our freezers get. Um, so yeah, I just make sure it's been frozen. I, I've heard if it's super cold, it's it's very quick. If you get it really, really, if it's super yeah, cold, right? But the, you know, but not if it's not so cold, you have it's longer. Yeah, so. I think when I put in a lot of fish, I think it takes a day to freeze in my freezer. Mm -hmm. To freeze to the middle of the pack. <laughs> so yeah, that's a okay. long time. Yeah. And the cannery is those big flash freezers. I think they're, does anybody try colder? my mouth and say the wrong Zero time? But three and a half hours and bring down about negative 30. Oh, okay, I was going to say three hours. Okay. 30 below zero Fahrenheit? That's how cold they get. Do they keep them that cold, or do they just? They just fly through the air. Just like a freezer. Okay. Just like a freezer. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. nuts. Um, Yeah. I mean, lots of people, take long to historically, cure, so many people hours. have eaten fresh, uh, have eaten grab walks made with fresh salmon and it's totally fine to do so. I mean, just kind of just a really sharp knife to get the thin slices. Oh, to get the thin slices, yeah. The thin slices are really the key to the magical velvet texture of grab walks. It is, when you get the slice thin enough, it is just fantastic. And on that same note about bear, um, if there's anybody here who hasn't had bear, you have to cook it all the way. Oh, it's yeah. like pork. It has to. It can have to kind of. Don't eat rare bear. Good yeah, point. Don't do it. That out. Yeah. In fact, I have at home a bear loaf in the oven for my family, and I told Gabe, make sure now. Make sure when you take it out of the oven, cut into it, and make sure it's not so bloody. But I just do have to point out with that that bear sometimes, like pork, has a pink color that's not necessarily a bloody pink. Do you notice that? I, I, I always cook the heck out of mine. Yeah, well, but there's sometimes there's, and I'm not sure if it has like some kind of a reaction with <coughs> or something, but um, sometimes if you're cooking it and cooking it and cooking it and it's still pink, especially if it's pink around the edge, then it might not be the bloody pink, it might just be the. Like the sausage pink. Yeah, that's what meat thermometer is for. Oh, and then salmon stock. So, you want to make salmon stock? Ooh, really? Nice. You should see. I have often felt like the freak in the world because I make salmon stock and people look at me like I am crazy. Do you leave your eyeballs in it? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, this is the one picture I did have from my own photo library because I just like the... Yeah. yeah, fish stock is awesome, and not just for chowder, although it is, there is no, you can't go back to chowder without fish stock, mm -hmm. um, have chowder with fish stock, but um, all kinds of things, you can cook rice in it, you can use it in sauces, I find that it actually doesn't, if I add it to stuff with onions, and like if I make a soup without salmon, and it has all the onions and veggies in it, I kind of feel like maybe it's just the idea. Salmon, but I feel like it doesn't necessarily have an overbearing fish flavor, so I feel like it's pretty versatile. So when you make the stock, do you, add, do you just cover it with water? Um, just... Yeah, so I have the giant stock pot someone gave me once for my birthday, and I put um, like however many, I mean you don't want to fill your pot full, but whatever size pot you're using, fill it maybe a third, two thirds full of fish carcasses, and then just to make sure they're covered with water. You don't need them to be covered by a whole lot, but you know, you don't want it. And then the trick with salmon stock is not overcooking it. So with chicken and, and meat bone stock, you just want to cook the heck out of it. But with salmon stock, about once it comes to a simmer, just let it lightly simmer for about half an hour. And in my opinion, I mean, I don't know how long do you guys cook yours for? 20 minutes, half an hour. Until it looks done. Yeah. Until it looks done. <laughs> yeah, so until it looks done. You cook it until it looks done, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think that's about half an hour. And then strain it out. Um, and that way it doesn't get if you when I first started making fish stock I didn't know that and I would cook the heck out of it like meat stock and it's kinda of weird. So if I could any other questions about the salmon stock? Because I feel like everyone should be making salmon stock. Mm -hmm. Do you do you freeze it or do you can it? I can it, but you can freeze it. How, how, how long do you can it for? I believe it's 20 minutes for a pint jar, but at, you want to look like over 11 pounds? pounds? At 10 pounds. And that, and that, I mean, even though you're not supposed to cook and cook and cook it, canning it is... Once the bones are out of it, yeah, it seems it's like okay. it's fine. Okay. I mean, I do feel like it's better fresh, and okay. it would be ideal to probably to freeze it. Yeah, that would but probably be the ideal flavor is to freeze your stock, but... I don't have much space in my freezer, so yeah. I can't, and it's still very good. Spruce tips, so this is my favorite plant to share with people because, um, <coughs> because we have so many, and they're everywhere, and the nice thing about harvesting from trees is, as a plant
plant person when I'm teaching people about plants who are new to harvesting plants. There's always the worry that people are going to over harvest. Like as a forager, you kind of get used to how much you can get away with harvesting and have things still um, be thriving. But when you're encouraging people to harvest from the trees, there's no fear because the trees are way up there. This is what kind of damage can you do unless you get a cherry picker. So just you can go ahead and take all the spruce tips you want from the ones you can reach about this high. And this is where you want to harvest them at. So they're <coughs> just coming out. They'll have these papery husks on them when they're first coming, pushing out in the spring. In fact, you can see them forming out there right now. Um, and then at some point, they'll push those papery husks off. And that's the ideal time to harvest them, which is if they still have the papery husks on them, they're just kind of it's something you got to get off. And that's kind of annoying. But um, if you wait too long, they start to get pokey. They start to turn into actual spruce needles. But at this stage, they're soft and pliant. And you can eat them just that way. I mean, they're soft enough. You can just pop them in your mouth. It's very flavorful. They don't necessarily want to go around eating spruce tips like berries. But um, it's fun to pop a couple in your mouth. And then you can cook them in all kinds of different ways, traditional, uh, or I should say common ways to cook them are into jam, or jelly, and uh, syrup. But I really like using them in savory recipes as a lemony flavor. They have like a lemony pine flavor. So they taste like the woods, but sour and zingy and bright. Um, so my favorite thing to make is salsa. And uh, just add it right into your salsa recipe. You can use it either in red salsa or in green salsa if you're using tomatoes. So, so how much would you use? Like it's like a spice. I use, use spices. So, I use about I mean, you, two you cups. Make... I think I use two cups of spruce tips to four cups of tomatoes. Okay, that's a quite. So a I mean, it's not so strong like a spice exactly. It's more like lemons. Okay. You just cut them up really fine. Or... Um, no, actually, I um, just I like just to cut them in half so that you can still see oh. a little piece of spruce tip because I like to see my little piece of spruce tip. And they're really, if you get them at the right stage, that once they have soaked in the, you know, the tomato and the lemon juice in your salsa, so they're gonna break it down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're not bulky at all. Cool. And um, then you get to have the little bite of zing. Mm -hmm. You get a spruce tip in your salsa, and you know you have you dip your chip, and there's a little spruce tip on there. It's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. so. Do you ever try making wine out of spruce tips? No, I'm not a I'm a wine maker. We had uh, salt spruce tips. You know, like sea salt with spruce tips. Yeah, I've made shortbread. I didn't make it, but it was really good. That's not good. Yeah. Shortbread? Um, you make, you boil the tips to make a juice, it's actually more than it's actually technically a tea, and then just add so much sugar you can't believe it. It's like a mint <laughs> jelly recipe. Right tons of syrup. I mean, just any syrup. It's like half and half, I think, half juice or tea and half sugar. Um, yeah. Salad dressing. So oh, you can just put it in a jar and cover it with vinegar and make spruce tip vinegar and then use that for your salad dressing. It's an easy thing to do with it. So, nettles at the top there, stinging nettles. There are stinging nettles around, but there is a, there are only in a few select places on the Delta and I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> but I will give you the clue that they like rich fertile dirt soil, and there isn't very much rich fertile soil around in general, so try to think of places where there might be. And then you can go looking for them, and if you find them, you will have won the prize! Because sea nettles are fantastic. Um, you can pick them, most people pick them with gloves on, because they will sting you. Um, I don't pick them with gloves on, because I kind of like the feeling. It's it's like an electrical current to me. Kind of looks like mint. It looks a lot like mint. So for my 35th birthday, I got a tattoo of a stinging nettle on my arm, and I was really excited. I went to a tattoo parlor, and I had you know a shop tequila before I 
and I had it, some pictures, and I had him draw it on my arm, and then I was like, yeah, that's awesome, that's just like what I was thinking. And then he tattooed my arm, and then the next day I woke up and I said, that's not a metal, that's a hairy mint. There's a hairy mint on my arm. <laughs> but fortunately, I just really just wanted a plant on my arm. <laughs> so the moral of that story is, if you are going to get a tattoo, go to your tattoo artist the day before, have him draw it on your arm, and then go home and sleep with it, and think about it, and connect. <laughs> um, stinging nettles, if you, of course, you have to cook them because they have to sting. You don't want to eat them like that. Um, but what the, you just have to wilt them, basically. It's very quick. And they cook kind of like spinach real, real fast, so you don't want to cook them too much. And traditionals to make nettle soup, um, pureed with potatoes and onions and stuff. Uh, they're also great in lasagna or like a spanakopita with filo dough. Um, or ravioli. Uh, then we have beach greens down here. This is some people really like the flavor of beach greens. I personally don't, but it, it to me it just tastes like low tide. But it's got a really nice texture, so taste some and see if you like it. Because if you do, there's a lot of it around. It grows down the beach, and it's a succulent plant, so it has a nice crisp leaf. And the nice thing about um, the beach greens is you can harvest them like pretty much through the summer because it stays nice and tender and good tasting. And the other one over here, it's harder to find uh, mountain sorrel, but if you do find it, that's another one that you can harvest pretty late in the year. It's, the leaves are real, they just stay real tender, and uh, it has a tart, lemony flavor like if you would have regular sorrel. No one's had sorrel? And it's just mm -hmm. the leaves that you harvest? Um, yeah. Sorrel? Yeah, just the leaves. The, see the, at the bottom, and they have the, again, the red around them. Who knows why? But um, they like, they like alpine areas, and they especially like, they like it wet. So, like around mountain streams, you'll find them. Um, and sometimes when you find them, you'll find just tons of them, and you can pick lots and lots. And I like to make pesto with it. That's my favorite thing to do. And my favorite plant to use for pesto is the mountain sorrel. So I'll pick a bunch of it and just a huge batch of pesto, which freezes beautifully. With that recipe, do you just a uh, normal, pest, normal pesto recipe, like with pine mm -hmm. nuts and garlic? Sometimes I just use oil <coughs> and, and sorrel and salt. And, um, oh, garlic, yeah, I always use garlic. But sometimes I add nuts, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I add cheese, sometimes I don't. I know how you feel about garlic. Yeah. Garlic is good. Um, you can make pesto out of stinging nettle too, you just have to cook it first. You can make pesto out of anything, and pesto is always good, so there's no shame in that. Um, yeah, anyone have any questions about any of these three plants? Next to the nettle, and where the nettle's growing, isn't there a plant that, if you get stung by the nettle, it's an antidote for it, and you get the stung? Nettle, so. nettle is an antidote for itself. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's another plant that goes along the side. Um, plantains. Don't remember that. I think it's in her book. Those are the two that I've seen um, used as a nettle antidote. It's nettle itself, which you have to crush up with a glove mm -hmm. to get the stings off and then take on. Or plantain. But I'm sure there's other ones. So it seems like she said it was on the grove right alongside the side which kind of underneath right around the tree. I don't think what grows around nettle. That would be it. <laughs> I certainly don't remember the name, but I just remember there is one. Yeah. I was working with a biologist on Milton, and he was having like elbows in the nest, and he rubbed his stinging nettles on his elbow every day. The stinging treat to get the sting. Yeah. To treat his stinging nettles. Yeah. 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 Ye
if you get a sting, you maybe just maybe don't do anything about it and see what you think. Might be one of the ones. So here is some fettuccine made with um, you add like a half cup of steamed nettles into a regular like two cups of flour pasta recipe. Um, really good. And then some pesto. And then as my daughter eating regularly. So lots of good things to do with greens. Okay, so uh, false hellebore, which I talked about earlier, is a toxic plant. You definitely don't want to eat it, but it's not like it's going to kill you. This plant will kill you. So this is an important plant for everyone in Cordova to know. It doesn't grow in places that we tend to hang out, so it's that's good. But um, it grows in marshy areas, which we have a lot of out on the Delta. And as you can see, it's got these kind of long, a little bit long, skinny leaflets, toothed. And it has the classic um, umbel of flowers. It's in the carrot family. Um, and it tends, those flower heads tend to come out more in uh, a sort of a round shape rather than the uh, turned outside umbrella shape. But I mean, really, if you see anything, at all like this. We do have an edible plant called Angelica that resembles water hemlock, but I don't recommend eating it unless you really know your plants because they can be very similar. So I just recommend staying away from anything that looks like that. What does it do to you? What does it do to you? Does it, like, does it kill you or it kills you? I mean, maybe if you got to the hospital really fast and had your stomach it would kill you. Yeah, some plants just make you sick. Death generally occurs within eight hours of ingestion. Yeah. There we go. It, you so don't work on your system? I think so. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't really remember. It depresses the respiratory system, it says in this very, very brief description here. This is when you stop breathing. So, yeah, if you're going to harvest um, wild plants, they're going to wild plants around here. What I always like to tell people is, learn the poisonous plants first. There's really only three plants that are going to hurt you around here. That's not hard to learn. There's, and then you'll just feel so much more comfortable harvesting everything else. So, get a field guide and look at water them up. So what are the other two? Uh, hellebore was, it's not that poisonous, but it's poisonous enough that you should know what it is. And then the other one I'm going to talk about. So, flowers. I love eating flowers. Flowers are really fun. They're really beautiful. You can throw them in a salad. They taste good. Kids love eating flowers. Columbine has... You're probably mostly familiar with Columbine, right? Yes, so it grows out a lot along the road on the Delta. There's nectar in each of those little tips that point up. Um, if you get the flower at the right stage, it will have literally little drops of honey. In, in those little tubes, which is really fun. Um, and of course, it's beautiful. Fireweed flowers, uh, salmonberry flowers. Salmonberry flowers is one of the first things that we like to put in salads. The first flowers that comes out, and they're so pretty. And there's, the only thing about harvesting flowers is, you know, then if you harvest well, blueberry flowers are really fun to eat in the spring. They're just little, the little lamps that hang down from the blueberries. And they also often have a drop of honey in the back of nectar. Um, and my kids love to eat the blueberry flowers, but the problem with that is that every time you eat a blueberry flower, there's one less blueberry going to be in the world later on. <laughs> but with salmonberries, I feel like we have not to spare. And fireweed, too. There's just so much fireweed. And most of the flowers, I just throw them in salads. Um, but you can also, if you want to make a tea out of fireweed flowers, it's really nice. But you, I recommend cold infusion, which means you just like sun tea, you just put the flowers in a jar, cover them with water, and leave them for like eight hours, four to eight hours. And then that's something that's nice. And then violets. I love violets. Uh, the, the leaves on violets are another one of the ones that will stay tender throughout the summer. So it's nice to extend the green season. Um, and you can eat them the leaves and flowers. And so the yellow ones are the ones that tend to grow in the woods, and the purple ones tend to grow in the muskeg, and they have a little bit um, more leathery of a leaf. It's not leathery, but it's... The yellow violet has a very tender leaf. Um, 
um, if any summer molds are a great thing to use. All the fresh greens and flowers that we've been talking about. And of course, if you ever have a hot day in Cordova, it's nice to have a summer mold. Late summer is the time for berries and mushrooms. And this is one of the wild plants that I feel like people are pretty familiar with, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about berries. Um, there are some hardcore berry pickers in Cordova, and they have their secret spots, and they won't even tell their family members sometimes about their secret spots. And Nagoon berries, for those of you who are new to town, that's the Nagoon berry there on the left. And that is like, if someone tells you they were Nagoon berry picking, don't just don't even ask them where they were, because they're not going to tell you. <laughs> Unless they were unsuccessful in that case, so we have to share. Um, then we have beach strawberries. Um, they grow all around, not just at the beach necessarily. And of course, the blueberries, lots of blueberries. We do have a variety of currant here, a stink currant, um, kind of a powdery blue. And I personally don't think it's that great tasting, so I haven't done much with it. Does anyone else here like to use the currants? We'll blend them with the blueberries, just because they're fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I noticed actually when I came out to your house that you had a bunch of currant bushes mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. But I can't get that mattress. <laughs> so um, salmon berries, we have so many of them, and I feel like they're the first berry that's like really plentiful. And um, but then what do you do with them? I mean, they're really good to eat, and you can make jelly, but you gotta. Well, you either have to not care about the seeds, and some people don't, or you have to strain the seeds out. It's a lot of work, and I feel that they don't make that great of a pie. Um, my favorite thing to do with salmon berries that I think is delicious is making juice with them. And uh, you can either cook them down and mash them and strain the juice off, or if you have a, a juicer, like a you know like a regular juicer that people use to make juice, then. I have like the kind that you put it in the hole and it goes, and I have an attachment for my kitchen aid. So it like goes down through an auger and then the juice squeezes out the bottom and then the little like bear poop looking stuff comes out the end. And it is yeah. so good, the salmon berry juice once you add. I feel like it needs a little bit of a sugar to really bring out the flavor or you can use white grape juice or honey. But it is so, just tastes like salmon, it's so good. And you can freeze it, it freezes beautifully. You can also can it, but as soon as you cook salmon berry juice, the flavor changes significantly. I don't know if you guys have noticed that making um, pies and stuff, but the flavor to me when it's raw is so bright and summery, and as soon as you cook it, it's still good, but it's just, to me, doesn't hold a candle to that fresh flavor, so I make the salmon berry juice and then I freeze it, and that's the fun. One of the jars I make room for in my freezer. So here's the other poisonous plant, baneberry. This is essential for every Cordovan to know because it grows in a lot of places around Cordova, um, right alongside trails, and it has a shiny red berry, and it, as few as any like seven berries can kill a child. So that's <laughs> that's one you want to know. Um, yeah, get a guide who can become familiar with it. One place I know for sure that it grows that you can go if you want to go and look for it specifically, which I recommend just so you can see it, uh, is the uh, Heaney Ridge Trail. So if you go up to Hartney Bay, the trail that starts right by the bridge there. Um, and you don't have to go very far before you'll see some either. So. Sometimes, white. Sometimes it has white berries, but I haven't seen it with white berries in Cordova, have you? I've only seen it. Yeah. I had in, in Haynes there was like, it seemed almost like equal red and white, but here I've seen them. They look like yogurt covered raisins. Yeah, well, these ones, they're very shiny and pretty, and I just think so easy for a kid to grab them through their mouth. Okay, on to mushrooms. Um, chicken of the Woods perplexed me for years because I was always picking it looking like this and thinking, I don't know what the fuss is about. This stuff is not very good. It's tough and it's really strong. It's sour tasting like no mushroom really. And then I found out that that is ideal. And even at that stage, you're just supposed to trim the edges off, right? the edges. So apparently I had always been eating it too old. So has anyone eaten it at this stage and liked it? Yeah. Yeah? 
Feral mm. mask and Lumi cooked it I way better than I did. It. it has a sour flavor that is well, it's not it's, exactly bad, but to it had me, it, just be, it had to be cooked for a long time. That was the full key, like. I think that's what I was never doing because normally mushrooms they cook so fast. Yeah, these I just take fry them so much time. And, and yeah. it really makes a difference. Yeah, I think I had never cooked them long enough. Because I definitely cooked at different times and it, it compared and like yeah. different lengths of time. Yeah, all I've ever done is just saute it in a pan with garlic and thought, how come that's not getting tender? Yeah, it takes a really long time. There's a lot of chicken in the woods around, uh, but it's earlier than. At least for me, I don't think of mushrooms, I don't even think about mushrooms until at least August, usually September. And the chicken in the woods, I feel like it's like July, do you think? Earlier, it's definitely mushroom. earlier than the other yeah, mushrooms. Yeah, definitely earlier. So, start looking for that one. And I heard this, this is summer from Kirsty that they kind of are, they come out by annually, because I wasn't seeing them this summer. Oh. Did you see them this summer? No, but I don't I just saw the old stuff. I only ever see the old stuff. That's the thing. That's why I had never well, seen, seen like last year's stuff kind of deal. I wasn't oh, last I didn't year's see yeah. and she goes yeah. and, and the prior year was really good. So anyways, if you don't see much around one summer, maybe it's because it's on an off year. Or it's just pretty maybe it depends what the summer before looks like. Yeah. So the last time I gave this talk it was in September at the Fungus Festival and it's funny because I had chosen this slide thinking, I don't know, is that a little too flower? But then it was literally looked exactly like that on the window when I gave this talk before. Um, so this is like not the funnest time of year for, for foraging because you have to get completely suited up. But at the same time, you gotta get outside somehow. And for me it's almost easier to go outside to harvest than it is to go for a hike when it's raining. So at least I feel like I'm kind of doing something. Um, winter chanterelles and hedgehog mushrooms, those are the main two that I harvest in there. It's just tons of them around, especially the chanterelles, so many. And they're very delicious. So I highly recommend looking for these two. And they're also both, both of these mushrooms are pretty obvious if you're getting to know mushrooms the chanterelles have. Um, rather than gills like mushrooms typically have. They have what looks more like folds of velvet around the gill area. If you are actually looking at one, it's pretty obvious. Um, and then the hedgehog mushrooms have the teeth coming down. So there isn't any poisonous mushrooms around here that have the teeth or the folded velvet look. Have you dried chanterelles? So many. <laughs> And they're really not as good after they're dried. So I started freezing them. And they taste just as good, almost as good after freezing as they are fresh. But I saute them first. And then, and then freeze them. Have you tried candy? I, I think I ever cooked them. The hedgehogs? Yep. That could be. It seems like the chanterelles were just chanterelles Maybe the chicken at the woods was just a road to can. That was so sturdy. But yeah, the problem with canning stuff is you have to cook it for so long. Um, pickled is another way that people preserve mushrooms. Mm -hmm. Good if you like pickled things. And you can use mushrooms. I mean, we just have so many mushrooms here. I really recommend getting out and picking them in the fall. And then you can use them in anything you use, you know, any, any kind of meat dish they're really good in. Really good with meat, or if you're a vegetarian and don't have meat, they're really good in place of meat. And ducks, I just can't help but say it, the, the word twice. Um, does anybody duck hunt? There's a fair number of ducks around, and they're delicious. And of course, the wild game. This is another thing that I feel like people are pretty familiar with. I think people around here pretty much, they know how to cook wild game. If you're getting it, then you generally know how to cook it. Not true in other places, but true here. The cranberries, this is just one, probably, probably the last main thing we'll talk about. We have three different kinds of cranberries. The high bush cranberry is not actually in the same family even as a true cranberry. Um, it grows tall and it has one single seed in a big juicy berry. And then we have the low bush cranberries, which are sometimes called lingonberries. 
And that's the, the oval shaped shiny leaf is the lingonberries. And that other leaf in there looks like either a crowberry or a heath. Um, and then we have the bog cranberries. Those are my favorite, but you can't, I mean, I've never found them where you'd be like getting enough to make jam or something, but they're delicious for just eating. And they're around in the muskets. You can even find them all winter long, mm -hmm. those little bog cranberries. Like, we're up in the reservoir right now, poking out from under yeah. the snow. And they still taste good, too. Yeah. Really good. And um, cranberries are the, I mean all berries, but cranberries especially, I feel like people don't really use them in as many different things as we could, because they have a great flavor for complementing meat, for sure. Um, also goes great with chocolate and lemons, in addition to just the regular things that people think of. And again, the juice, cranberries make a wonderful juice. Those hibish cranberries are pretty easy to juice, and it's, if you like hibish cranberries, which not everybody does. They have kind of a foot flavor, but um, <laughs> I like them. They make a great juice. It's, it's, it's like so fortifying. <laughs> so that brings us to winter, which we are now at the end of, and hopefully your stock doesn't look like that anymore. At this time of year, the shelf should be all emptied out, ready for the new harvest season, right? So you don't want to be putting up so much food that you have a shelf like this going into April. Um, and this is just a list of all the things that I like to put up, uh, ways that I like to, to put all those foods up for winter. Um, and I think we talked about pretty much all of these as we went through, but does anybody have any questions? You forgot goose tongue. I did forget goose tongue. Oh, no, I didn't forget goose tongue. I didn't list goose tongue because there's not that much of it around anymore. And that was one of the ones that Janice Schofield showed in her class several years ago, and she always used to go down. And honestly, I have seen somebody is going to the places where Janice had taken her class and just kind of clear cutting it. So there's not that much goose tongue around anymore. It's like a grass sort of looking plant that grows um, down by the beach. There's also a poisonous, it's not poisonous, but it's not good for you um, look alike to goose tongue. So. I kind of figured something was. Well, we were saying that in the northern district, there's goose tongue up there. There can be goose tongue, can just be really heavy in some places, and it's definitely a good one. Goose tongue is a, uh, a plantain. Tastes like spinach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good. And it stays tender through the summer. It's always in brackish areas, right? It's always growing when there's some, some kind of salt. Some kind of salt? Oh, yeah. What about chocolate lilies? Dirts. I want to see them. I didn't really think they were <laughs> worth eating myself. Okay. I've never had them. <laughs> you have to cook them, and then you got to drain the water, and then you got to cook them again. I still thought I was eating them with some party ladies. <laughs> and we were all like, oh. But um, I don't know, maybe we did it wrong. But yeah, there's chocolate lilies around, and they have a little garlic shaped uh, or garlic sized bulb made up of what's called I think corns and they're like little grains of rice and that is like our starchiest root um, that was traditionally harvested for a starchy food um, but yeah I, I don't particularly recommend it. Do you find lamb's quarter on this side of the sound? Do you, do you, do you pick lamb's quarter here? I have not found it. It's just a in my yard last year, but I haven't found it anywhere else. So is it, it? it the beach kind or the yard kind? In, in my Sorry. yard, I think it's the yard kind. Because in Fairbanks there was Lamb's Quarter, but it looked different than the beach kind. I mean, in the yard there was there's one kind, but on the beach there's a, there's a beach kind. Does it look significantly different, more succulent? Like it's, a lot more it's more spinachy. It's not, it's not so furry, like the yard kind. Um, yeah, and it doesn't have a little ball, like in the like in the yard kind of gets those little balls at the top, and I don't see that as beach kind. Maybe I'm never there late enough. It's really good. What's it called? I think it has a different name though. I feel like I've seen that plant in, in field guides, and it has a different name. The beach. I saw that. 
Oh, I saw it on the last photo. Oh, the, like, not, not here, but over on the phone. Oh, well, thank you guys yeah, all for coming out. Yeah, and, um, and it was on the beach. Anyone interested in the plant walks? Did you get your name on the list or make a note next to your name? And anyone interested in bear meat? Can you give me your phone number? I still have to order the part, so I'm in no hurry. Okay. When I get it, I'll give you a gene. Sounds good. Okay. Oh, no. Oh. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Oh, sorry, it's It's an awful sound. It's an awful sound. Look at this hair coming in up the middle. Everyone points out your phone. I think it was my car. Fine. Yeah. 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 I love I Hawkins and then come across right over like this is all kind of cut, you know, right cut off and then kind of have your You wouldn't come right because we just kind of put there's a spot we come across it is frequently kind of like a washing machine. Yeah, it'd be nice to go to the landing page and just whatever a rack is behind or something. Yeah, there's a place where the open ocean comes from. You know, so there's a, yeah, 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 you should, you should, you should, yeah, so you uh, really want to come to the lower tide because then the, there's a strawberry reef there off the top of it. Uh, right, like off the tip of Pigeon Brook. And it, then if, if the lower the tide, then the reef is higher and it's calm and it's anything coming in. So like we, we went out at high tide. Yeah, so then we went out and there was quite high tide. So we went out at a high tide, a rising high tide, because then it gets to that like you get so rough. There was good, good, I mean, it's calm, but it was good fight. It's so Maybe um, this weekend if you're on it, so it's better. Yes, we can do yes. Um, yeah, I think so. Okay, yeah. this best time. Yeah, yeah. So it's, well, we want to be on the side of the yeah. Yeah. So the film. Yeah. Is it going to his chest? Yeah, it, 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 one, one day. So did you find your daughter's dog today? All the days. It's actually probably was pretty funny. Are you okay on the boat? Yeah, I the pool. Yeah, I was like, wait a minute. Yeah, I think it was the kids. Yeah, it was like, 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 yeah, it was like,